Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great uh, that you can join us uh, today for this uh, for this masterclass, where we will be talking about uh, internal controls and uh, how internal controls can be vetted and can be what, what we can learn from earnings conferences about the internal controls and the working of them. And uh, I'm very proud to announce that we have uh, found uh, Christian Hofmann, uh, Sebastian Kuhn, uh, Nina Schweiger, all, all from the Ludwig uh, Maximilian University in Munich, and Jeroen van Raak from the University of Amsterdam prepared to uh, to give this uh, masterclass today. Very much looking forward to that. And uh, you know, what what can we learn uh, from uh, earnings conference calls uh, in terms of the working of the internal controls? That's a fascinating topic uh, in the way that I see it. Then uh, with that, I would uh, like to give you a very uh, nice seminar. I would like to uh, wish you a very nice seminar. Uh, at least I'm looking forward and uh, if you are looking forward to it as much as I do, you know, it will be a great seminar. So all the best uh, to Christian, Nina, uh, Jeroen and Sebastian. And uh, we look forward to what you have to say. So the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jan, for your that warm welcome. Um, welcome everyone to our uh, today's masterclass. Uh, the topic is internal control quality and audit quality. Um, and uh, on behalf of uh, the whole team, uh, Sebastian, Jeroen and Nina, um, I really would like to welcome you uh, to that uh, masterclass. Um, uh, it was announced that we would be uh, you, oops. Yeah. So the, um, the the goal of the objective of the um, project um, on internal control quality and audit quality is actually twofold. Um, so the two objectives are one: we would like to understand better the um, the relevance of internal control quality for audit quality. Uh, that's one part of what we are working on. Um, and the second uh, objective is to identify, to propose um, a new, maybe, information channel that would allow auditors to more accurately and potentially also to more efficiently um, assess the internal control quality. And now those two objectives are uh, exactly also what we want to present to you today in the masterclass. Uh, so first of all, um, a brief wrap up on what we do know from the literature um, with respect to internal control quality, um, the relevance for audit quality, um, as well as um, different ways to assess the uh, internal control quality. Then the second part of the masterclass uh, will be talking about one potential additional, one potentially new um, information channel that would allow um, auditors to assess the internal control quality, um, which are earnings conference calls. Um, so here we would like to briefly uh, introduce to you the structure of these calls, um, the role of financial analysts, which are really uh, an important um, uh, partner in that uh, in those conference calls, um, and also what we do know from prior literature with respect to the information value that is reflected in these earnings conference calls. And then in a fourth step, uh, we would like to present to you some um, preliminary evidence that we've collected uh, with respect to how earnings conference calls may uh, be useful uh, and can be used as an external information source um, to assess internal controls. Um, Wrap up then finally, um, depending on the time that we have available, I'd like to give you some a brief outline what um, awaits you, what we are working on um, in the two work packages that uh, constitute our uh, FAR research project. So with this, I hand over to Jeroen, who will give you an introduction into internal control qualities. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Christian. Um, I'll talk a bit about the um, relevance of the internal controls. Um, so at least from the literature, we know that it's important for uh, for the auditees, so the, the clients, to have good internal control quality. 
because it affects the reporting quality. So we know that if there are internal control material weaknesses, the reporting quality will typically be lower. And this is reporting quality typically measured as discretionary accruals. But you also see that it results in a higher risk of restatements. So material misstatements which have to be corrected in future periods. It also impacts the firm in terms of investment efficiency. So that means if companies have um, weak internal controls, that they are more likely to over or under invest. It also affects their cost of equity. And furthermore, it increases the covenant tightness. So basically meaning that uh, loan providers will be more strict to companies which have weak internal controls. So these are all signals that for the company um, itself, it matters to have high internal control quality. And we, we know that also from, um, for example, Sovereign Soxy Act, which has uh, been enacted in the early 2000s, um, that there was a reason to have, a, have stronger internal controls and to also assess the quality of those controls um, as done by the auditor nowadays. Of course, the internal controls are also very important for the auditor. Um, we all know the audit risk model, which we'll look at next. Um, but we know that it will affect the amount of testing which has to be done by an auditor. So the nature, timing and the extent of testing, um, the amount of substantive testing basically, depends on the quality of the internal controls. And furthermore, we know that if there's um, a weak internal control system at the client, and it also increases the residual risk. So the auditor is not actually able to solve all of this um, uh, risk by doing more audit work. But we see also that the risk of litigation and reputation loss increases. So it also signals that it's relevant for the auditor to um, identify, to assess the control risk accurately and to, to resolve it as well through the audit process or to um, improve the internal controls in future periods. So that advises to the client basically. Now, this topic is, of course, very relevant, um, but there hasn't been a lot of research done in this area. Um, and we assume that this is mainly because of um, the complexity um, related to the measuring of these risk factors. So it's very difficult to actually do this based on publicly available data. And we believe that uh, with the FAR data, we can uh, make some important contributions uh, in this regard. So this is the, uh, the audit risk model. Um, you all know that. Sorry, uh, Jan has a question uh, to the prior slide. Maybe you can. I, I don't know if I can go back. Maybe you can help me, Dan. Nina. Th thanks, Christian. And uh, uh, great introduction, Jeroen. But my question is, so, so I actually see uh, only advantages uh, for firms to have uh, high quality controls. Yet there's quite a lot of, quite a lot of, I mean, it happens to quite a lot of firms that they found out that their controls are weak. So what is the economic rationale then for firms to have weak controls? Into the controls, um, sorry. Yeah, there can, there can be different reasons. Indeed, I focus on the, on the, the positive aspects. Um, of course, it's the, the cost. Um, Part is um, makes it an economic trade-off, um, depending on like how what are the risks which you want to resolve by having strong internal controls versus the cost of implementing those internal controls. So this is an economic question. At the same time, it's also difficult to have um, strong internal controls, right? So it's not just a matter of throwing more money um, at the internal controls until a point that you get perfect control. So that um, it's also not feasible, right? So I think there will always be a residual risk. Um, and then I think a final reason why controls could be weak is just opportunistic behavior, right? So having um, weak internal controls also allows for more earnings management, for example. So for some managers, it might just not be very attractive to have uh, those strong internal controls. And I think all auditors know, so if you, you do an assessment of internal controls, um, you always indicate the risk of management override. So that, that also indicates that um, this risk will always be present. So, so why would shareholders then accept that? Because it's in the, to their disadvantage, because 
they can they can hide results, uh, you know, to shareholders. Um, they they can actually uh, uh, get benefits. So if, if it is management, they can get benefits. So why would why would they do that? Then? Why would the shareholders then accept that? Yeah, I think for for shareholders typically, it, um, taking it, keeping aside the, the the cost perspective, right? Um, it would be attractive to have stronger controls. Um, but I see a lot of downsides directly for the um, for the shareholders. Um, that also um, explains uh, why, for example, in the US there's regulation, right? So there also has been some discussion about this in the Netherlands to have um, companies report on the quality of the internal controls and to, to have auditors be more explicit about the, the um, controls and perhaps also in the Netherlands report the internal control material weaknesses if, if present. So I don't yeah, I think for the for the shareholders, um, typically it's, it's important to have strong internal controls. And perfect is probably not possible, but strong internal controls. I think it's beneficial for the shareholders. Thank you. If I may add here just one uh, additional idea, Jan, uh, which is, I mean, the uh, uh, we know that the delegation of decision rights from shareholders to managers creates that separation of ownership and control, right? And the uh, um, incentive problems that materialize within firms, but still shareholders delegate the decision rights despite the fact that uh, that separation then is present, basically because um, uh, they don't have the, they may lack the expertise, the shareholders, uh, uh, to, to make those decisions by themselves. Um, and then the uh, alternative for delegation uh, outweighs the benefits associated with that outweighs the cost if the um, uh, shareholders were in charge um, themselves um, with respect to those decisions. And I think that's just a nuanced alternative way of answering uh, your question um, along similar lines as Jeroen has just um, pointed out. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. And uh, Jeroen, there are two other questions, one from Tibbe and one from Rick. Uh, I'm not sure if I can see the chat myself can i see meeting chat is muted for me so okay if so, you will ask a question then i'm happy to answer <laughs> so tibbet you might want to yeah jump sure in. i mean i mean mine was was more of a of a comment right that um company it, it might be beneficial also for shareholders um uh, to, to have a, a great amount of flexibility right to have have some the leeway in the internal controls to um, yeah to take advantage of opportunities and and achieve higher growth, um, but that that would um, that would mean that that the internal control will be weaker, and and also I mean setting up an internal control uh, system and uh, Jan we have some experience uh, with that at the foundation is actually quite expensive right <laughs> so also to operate it at least in the short run. And, and, and Rick, do you want to raise your question? Yes, yeah, sure. So, so I was wondering, you're now kind of addressing the relevance of internal control um, material weaknesses on the order process, but, but what about the, the outcome? Is that also something you considered? So, for instance, how does the, the level of internal control quality of an entity influences the quality um, the audit firms can provide on their audit? Yeah, this is definitely something um, we're, we're interested in. Um, so we we do know, of course, that the, the audit process at large will be um, affected by the level of um, inherent risk and, and as, well as, uh, as well as the control risk. Um, but I think it's a very interesting question to see if they just compensate for this by doing more work or if it actually affects the audit quality. So if, if the residual risk is um, at some point impacted in a negative sense or whether auditors kind of step up their game and, and uh, audit quality somehow even improves. So I think these are all very relevant questions. Um, isn't, um, I think there's a bit early to answer. So uh, we are, of course, um, yeah, at, at the early stages in this, in this project, um, still looking for um, this data. So waiting for this to be delivered by the audit firms. So it's too early for us to answer um, empirically whether uh, whether there's an effect and what the effect would be like. But that's definitely interesting, Rick. Yeah, okay. 
M might be an idea to connect on this somewhere afterwards. I'm doing a part time PhD within Deloitte and actually looking into this subject. She would be curious to share some thoughts on that, what you guys are uh, uh, seeing and uh, what we see uh, within uh, my firm. Yeah, please, it would be, be great. So, okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, let, let's look. I was um, going to go to the auto twist model, which uh, I think all of you are familiar with. It's something which is described a lot in the, the auditing literature and auditing textbooks, um, referred to also in, in, in some of these standards, uh, at least in the US. Um, and we know that the auditor is quite sort of risk that the auditor issues an inappropriate audit opinion, so a clean audit opinion when there are material misstatements left in the financial statement. And they say basically that audit risk is a function of the risk of material misstatements, so the risk that there are material misstatements in the financial statement statements and the detection risk so the audit risk can basically be lowered by putting in more audit work so by increasing the amount of substantive testing now we also know that this risk of material misstatements um, can be divided into certain two components the inherent risk and the control risk so the inherent risk basically is the probability that there are material misstatements um, assuming that no internal controls were present in the company. And then we have the control risk, uh, which looks at the risk that those material misstatements are still present after um, taking the controls into account. And of course, we split it up here because of the focus for our, uh, of our studies will be on the control risk. And I think it's very interesting to just examine this model. Um, like was just pointed out by Rick, uh, I think it's interesting to see how those factors are related to each other. So you could expect, for example, that inherent risk and control risk are typically positively associated. So if the inherent risks are higher, then the control risk will be higher as well. Um, but you also want to see how the detection risk will be impacted. Yeah. So the, is it really the case that if inherent risk and control risk are increased, that alters um, lower the detection risk? And we want to also know to what extent they do this. Uh, because then we get to, to risk, uh, Rick's question, um, how does it impact the audit risk, so basically the audit quality. And I think there's not, not um, that much effort um, work done to examine the audit effort, so that, that I think is very interesting avenue to pursue. Uh, um, this is the audit risk model, the same things we can also see from the, the standard. So if you look at ISA 330, which looks at the auditor's procedures in response to assessed risks, um, they say that the auditor should design and perform all the procedures, like I said, whose nature, time and extent are based on um, the assessed risk of material misstatements. They should consider the assessments, so they should consider how they got to a certain um, assessment of the inherent risk and control risk, how they, why they determined it to be low, moderate or high, for example. And from the standard, you can see that uh, the auditor will have to obtain more persuasive audit evidence if the assessed risks are higher. So even though um, I don't think the audit risk model is explicitly mentioned in, 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 um, in the ISAs, um, you, you still get the same uh, um, relations um, as illustrated in, in this standard. So they also signal that the auditor should respond to the assessed risk by adjusting the audit effort. Now, of course, there are different ways um, in which the auditor can um, respond. So we already talked about the nature, uh, timing, and the extent of testing, which will be reflecting will be reflected in the audit fees. So the auditor will have to typically do more audit uh, have to put in more audit hours. Uh, we'll have to do more substantive testing if the quality of the internal controls is lower. Um, at the same time, we also see that auditors might charge uh, a risk premium. So it's not just a matter of um, increasing the audit effort, but they might say, well, there will be some residual risks. We, we won't be able to completely offset the increased uh, control risk. So there will be an increased, a higher litigation and reputation risk. And therefore, we might uh, decide to charge a risk premium. Um, from other papers, uh, for example, Lunke and Smith, we also see that auditors demand greater audit adjustments if the risks are higher. So there will be um, the effect there is twofold, right? So if the controls are weaker, then there will typically be more material misstatements. 
So there are more material misstatements to detect and to correct, and at the same time, the author will be more strict. And then we see this effect mainly related to income decreasing adjustments, which of course makes sense because um, uh, investors are typically mostly concerned about upward earnings management. So this is a bit about how the author responds to um, lower internal control quality. And now we've also prepared some questions for you guys. You already started firing questions at us, but we have questions for you as well. Um, for this, we would like to use send steps. You can um, scan the QR code on the left hand side or go to your browser, your web browser, um, and go to the website sendsteps.me. And then log in with this ID, UFA2983. For those of you who um, use the QR, code, the QR code, I would like to ask you to not close the website because the QR code is only visible once. Um, but at some, yeah, if you haven't closed anyway, you can always go back to sendsteps.me and log in with this ID. And this ID will also be visible on, uh, on further slides. And for those of you who want to, um, Refrain from using the website. You can also just send a text message to it. Um, I'm not sure if it's completely visible, the, the number here. Um, plus 346, I'm not sure if I can see it. Uh, here's a zero 0200, and then you can basically type UVA2983 a space, and then your answer A, B, C, or D. And probably easiest just to go to sendsteps.me uh, and then log in with UVA2983. So our first question is, how complex is the determination of internal control risk? So we are very curious um, to your experiences uh, in determining, um, assessing this control risk. Is it something which is pretty straightforward? Is it somewhat complex or is this uh, a very complex uh, matter? So let's have a look. What do you think about this? OK, so uh, nobody thinks that it's an easy task, um, which I was afraid that yeah, um, nobody would say that. Right? It would have been too great if everyone said, well, this, this would have been so easy and uh, uh, then a lot of issues would have been resolved immediately. But so I think most of you have voted yeah, either very complex or moderately complex. Um, is there anyone in the audience who wants to comment on, on what they voted on A or B? Explain why you consider this to be very or moderately complex. What is it that makes this assessment of control risk so difficult? So Andrew put a, a comment in the chat about the auditor's ability to um, foresee things that might go wrong um, and that, that that affected the um, outcome of the audit risk model, um, obviously. Yeah, it's very difficult right, to see the whether the internal controls are effective. If you, yeah, you typically become aware afterwards, right, if they fail to work. I think that's a very good point. I think it's also interesting to note in, in that in the past, um, the auditors just tended to classify control risk as high because it was basically easier for auditors to um, say, well, the control risk is high and then do a lot of substantive testing as opposed to saying the control risk is low and then proving that the control risk is in fact um, very limited. So auditors typically made a a trade off there and said, well, it's just very difficult to, to prove that the controls are working effectively and therefore we just set it as high and then do more, more substantive testing. Now with Sabine's Oxy, of course, we saw that auditors are required to report on, on the effectiveness of the controls and they have also started to rely more on those controls. However, I think recently there has been some criticism, at least in, in the Netherlands, on um, the assessments of um, controls and control risk and the effectiveness of those controls um, as expressed by the AFM. So the AFM indicated that authors were sometimes um, maybe taking it slightly too easy uh, or having not enough um, support to argue that um, controls are actually working effectively. So what we see nowadays is again that authors start to rely less on those 
to rely less on the controls and, and switch again more to substantive testing, also fueled by the possibility is uh, made possible by data analytics. So I think that's an interesting trend and it's something we definitely want to analyze as well. Now, of course, um, ISO 315 states that the auditors shall perform risk assessment procedures to provide a basis um, for the identification and assessment of the risk of material misstatements. Um, and we know that um, the assessment of control risk is in fact difficult. Um, we saw that following the SOX implementation in the US, the audit fees um, increased substantially. So there was a huge increase in, um, at that time. So that does have to um, flatten out again, of course, but there was a big shock to the auditing profession that they had to audit the effectiveness of uh, internal controls. We also see that auditors actually are pretty good at um, detecting the internal controls. So we see that auditors um, are actually doing a better job at detecting deficiencies than clients do. Uh, here we, of course, do have to take into account that the client might have different incentives than the auditor. So the client might indeed have incentives to downplay the internal control risks. Um, and we know that um, auditors are actually not affected, or there's not an independence issue here. So auditors actually detect more internal control material weaknesses um, when the audit fees are higher. So that could be a matter of protecting their reputation, or it might be that they have increased their audit fees um, as soon as they detected that internal controls are weak and therefore did more, more audit work. So we do see that the assessment of control risk is difficult, it's costly, um, but auditors do at least um, perform better in this regard than the clients themselves. So it makes sense that the auditors um, perform this assessment. Now, if one more, well, I have one more question, and we'll follow more questions for you guys later on. Um, but to assess the control risk, which informations would information sources would you rely on for this assessment? And this is an open question, so you can actually go to sensesteps.me and basically type uh, what information sources you would use to assess control risk. Well, interesting to see. So we see that the prior year audit inquiries, view of audit documentation, um, observation of the internal controls to see how they actually operate in practice. We've got the Unix conference calls. Um, we've got IT audits. Very good. So I think yeah, we, we cover a lot of the aspects which uh, auditors do in fact use and which are also required by the auditing standards, right? So the auditing standards prescribe that um, there's an inquiry that there's inspection of document, documents and records um, that, uh, uh, that you examine the, um, the internal controls or so two observations to examine how they actually work. I think it's very, very good and typically the, um, the best way to assess the controls is just by going to experience in terms of how well the controls worked in the, in the prior year. So it's very difficult, I think, to assess the, the control risk um, for the first year audit, right? At the beginning of the audit, um, this is going to be very complex. And I think once you're doing the audit, you can get better insights into um, those controls, which, the, which controls the company has, um, whether they're working effectively. We see also an IT audit being mentioned here. So that relates, for example, to process mining as well, I think. Um, so those are new tools which are used by auditors to, to see um, how transactions are recorded, if the right people sign off, and et cetera. So I think that's very interesting. If we look at the standards, then we do indeed see um, many of the points you pointed out, so the inquiries of management and others uh, within the entity, for example, to interviews observation of, um, of the application of controls, inspection of documents and records. They also talk about the use of analytical procedures, which I don't think was mentioned. Um, and we're also interested in looking at if there are more information sources available. Of course, I think that what you mentioned, the 
Um, by a year audits and just the, the general experience of auditors are very insightful. But we were also um, interested in examining whether auditors rely on the work of financial analysts, um, the way in which managers talk and, and communicate to see if auditors can use this kind of information in assessing the quality of internal controls, not just for uh, subsequent audits, but also for initial first year audits. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Nina. Thank you very much, Jeroen, for the kind introduction. And first of all, of course, thanks to the whole FAR team for organizing this great event. It's uh, cool that we have the opportunity here to present our work today. As we have learned now that earnings conference calls might be one important external information source in order to assess the quality of internal controls, I would like to dig a little bit deeper into that topic. And first of all, I'd like to give you an overview on the structure of these conference calls. So conference calls are usually organized as a two-stage disclosure process with two elements. Uh, first of all, we have the presentation session where the management gives the brief scripted presentation on the firm's past and future performance. So that is really a, a short description of what happened in the past, which means the last quarter, but also the last year, and a very uh, small outlook on the future, and in scripted, which means it is prepared ex ante. After that, we have the Q&A session where the non-corporate participants, and these are usually uh, financial analysts, have the opportunity to ask questions which are then directly answered by the corporate participants, and that is usually uh, the CEO or the CFO. According to regulation fair disclosure, this is also the only opportunity where the, the financial analysts can directly approach the firm's management. Listed US firms usually execute the earnings conference calls at a quarterly, quarterly basis, so usually we have four observations then per year. The average length of these conference calls is roughly one and a half hour. Just to shed a little bit more light on the structure of these calls, let me just very quickly give you an example here on uh, of Apple's earnings conference calls in Q2 2018. So on the left hand side, you see a list of corporate participants. So that's just an excerpt of uh, Apple's earnings conference call. So you see that we of course have the CEO, Tim Cook on the list. Um, then we have the CFO, that's Luca Mastri. And finally, the third, there's a third person in the room that's Nancy Paxton. She is the senior director of IR and Treasury. On the right hand side, you see then a small excerpt of the conference call participants. So as you can see, this is basically a list of financial analysts here. So it indicates the name in the first line and below that we have information on the employer of that uh, financial analyst and we have an information on the function of the individual analyst. Just to be a little bit more specific here, how does then uh, this call moves on? What happens during that call? We have on the left hand side a very small excerpt of the presentation session and on the right hand side the Q&A. So the presentation session, as you can see, starts with the operator. The operator has the responsibility to introduce uh, the participants in that call and then uh, to hand over to the first person from, from the firm, that is in that case the um, investor relations manager, Nancy Paxton. She then introduces uh, the most important, important uh, person in the room, that's the CEO, Tim Cook, who then uses the opportunity to again welcome uh, the participants in that call and also provide an outlook um, on the future and uh, give a recap on the past. On the right hand side, you see then the Q&A session. Here again, it's the operator that starts. Um, he has the uh, task to order the questions and then of course uh, uses the opportunity to introduce the first financial analyst that's Shannon Cross here from Cross Research LEC who has the opportunity to ask the first question, which is then directly answered by Tim Cook. As you might observe by looking at that very small excerpt here, it's a very friendly style that is used here. So you see that they all use the first name. So it seems to be that they are quite familiar with each other. With that, I'd like to come to our next poll question. Um, and of course, our next poll question is uh, covering the topic of earnings conference calls. And first of all, we are super interested in getting to know whether you have ever joined an earnings conference call. And the answers are just yes or no. So I just give you one minute to quickly answer that question. And then let's see what we what we can learn from that. <laughs> 
Okay, that is super quick and exactly what I think we expected to see. So most of you, 72% have never joined an earnings conference call and roughly 30% have once, at least once joined an earnings conference call. So I guess for those of you who have answered that they haven't joined a conference call yet, um, I think most of you have at least seen um, or have got some experience with these earnings conference calls, but just having a look at the transcript maybe. But that is exactly what we expected, I guess. Then I have another question before I will move on with uh, the literature ideas that we already have, namely which part of the earnings conference call would you focus on? So we just talked about two sessions, the presentation session A and the Q&A session B. And our question would be, which part of this earnings conference call would you focus on? Which one do you think is more informative? And oh, that's a super cool picture that we have here. So all of you think that the Q&A session is more informative. Um, I think that perfectly fits to what we will tell you in a few minutes. Um, and let's see whether this fits then also to your arguments why you have selected B and not, not A. So in the following, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, the setting of earnings conference calls. So characterize that setting a little bit more and thereby then also answer the question whether the Q&A or the presentation sessions is more informative. And um, you will see that your answer perfectly fits uh, the literature results. So earnings conference calls, we can conceptualize earnings conference calls as a strategic information exchange. And in that strategic information exchange, we have two big players. On the one hand, we have the financial analyst. On the other hand, we have the firm's management. This means that we have a strategic information exchange between the financial analyst group and the firm's management. But we also have a strategic information exchange within that group of financial analysts. What do we mean by strategic information exchange? Strategic information exchanges are characterized by two important attributes. That's first of all the information asymmetry. This means that one party in the room is better informed than the other. And of course, in our conference course setting, that's pretty easy. It's the management that is typically better informed about the firm and its performance compared to financial analysts. Second, information dependence. Uh, we know that analysts uh, depend on management provided information in order to issue accurate forecasts. This means that both parties in the room, the management as well as the financial analysts, have an incentive to deceive, have the opportunity to deceive. But of course, in our setting, that's typically the managers that may opportunistically use the information advantage in these conference calls. So for instance, we know from prior literature that managers prefer to disclose favorable over unfavorable information because this is highly rewarded by capital markets. Therefore, the question comes in, given this opportunistic behavior by the firm's management, what can financial analysts then do in order to get um, the analyst talk more accurately about the firm and its performance. So how can they manage that the firm provides better and more information? To answer that question, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the role of financial analysts first. So financial analysts typically serve as information intermediaries and they do so by acquiring new information that would otherwise not be available um, for, to investors. And second, by interpreting that information, so by providing their own assessment, their own interpretation on the firm and its macroeconomic environment. So thereby they make use of all information sources that they have. This can be public, this can be private, and then provide information that is valuable to capital markets via several, um, several possibilities. First, they can make use of earnings forecasts to provide that information. They can um, offer a stock recommendation that gives uh, parts of their information to the public. And they also have reports that are informative about analysts interpretation and assessments. Why do we then expect these financial analysts to uh, provide uh, value, value rele relevant information? We do so because they are macroeconomic and industry expert. At least they are considered to be macroeconomic and industry experts. There are several arguments why, why that should be true. First of all, they have pr proprietary access to macroeconomic data that is uh, likely not available to other capital market participants. 
Moreover, due to their job, they have the time and also skills to analyze the data. Moreover, they have a broader perspective. So compared to investors, compared to the firm's management, they have a rather broader perspective, and this enables them to put together all the pieces of information that are needed in order to precisely assess the impact of macroeconomic factors on the firm and its competitive environment. Finally, as financial analysts typically cover the industry as a whole, so they typically cover all, most of the important firms in an industry, they are seen as um, in experts in terms of knowledge on key competitors, and they have perfect information on industry dynamics. So overall, these arguments suggest that financial analysts are macroeconomic and industry experts. This is also consistent and found by prior research um, that has offered evidence that financial analyst interpretation role is also valuable to investors. So even if financial analysts just replicate what the management has uh, told the capital market before, the market reacts to that because their interpretation role is highly important. Coming back now to our conference call setting, um, how can these financial analysts now engage in, in these earnings conference calls um, and how, why, do they, why should they do so? And what does that mean in terms of information generation? So conference call increased analysts' ability to generate accurate forecasts. So we know from prior research that those firms that regularly offer conference calls have uh, better analyst forecasts, so more precise analyst forecasts. So it seems to be that uh, participating in these calls, um, asking questions in these calls helps to generate accurate forecasts. But why should financial analysts care about forecast accuracy? That's pretty easy to answer because this is an important determinant of their compensation, reputation, as well as turnover. So we know from prior research that investors base their, um, their assessment on analysts based on forecast accuracy. We know that also employers uh, decide based on forecast accuracy how to promote these guys. And we also know from survey studies that forecast accuracy is a significant driver of their compensation. So overall, these two uh, slides before um, give us two conclusions here. The first one is that financial analysts question during calls have information value, and this is due to their uh, information collection activities. Moreover, we expect also these analysts to participate in calls, to ask informative questions, and the reason is that they want to generate accurate forecasts. With that background information in mind, I'd like to come back to my earlier question that now summarizes the prior uh, discussion, and that is the question, why and how should financial analysts behave in these calls in order to get better information? So in order to motivate the management to provide more and less biased information. Christian, um, colleagues here at, at LMU and myself, we have a working paper on that. And this working paper draws the conclusion that financial analysts can increase the uh, quality of management provided information by strategically phrasing their questions. So from a theory perspective, we argue that by phrasing questions negatively, analysts signal knowledgeability. So they signal that they are aware of negative issues related to the firm. Second, they signal assertiveness. Assertiveness means that they signal that they are willing to push for a response as long as it is needed in order to get a response. So they will push as long the management to give an answer until they also get an answer that is uh, satisfying. To be a little bit more specific here, let me show you one example. What do we mean by a negatively phrased question? This is an example by James Bash from Dialectic Capital Management, um, and the firm is Telabs Inc., uh, and that's Q1 2011, the conference call. The question reads as follows. Given the current stock price underperformance versus your comp, how have you guys failed in your execution? And I guess all of you will agree that this is really a negatively phrased question. That's a tough one. It signals knowledgeability. It signals that this guy is willing to push for a response. What happens then to the firm's management? So we argue that thereby analysts can activate managers' concern regarding reputation, litigation, and credibility. 
So this question reminds the CEO or CFO of the firm uh, that there are reputation issues if he or she is not answering that question truthfully. Conse consequently, what we find is that managers are more uh, are willing to give more information or better information. So we find that the answers are getting longer. The information that provi is provided is less positively biased and we find more quantitative information. So we find more numbers in the answers. What we also find that is not listed here on that slide is that financial analysts can also increase their forecast accuracy by applying this, this questioning style. Overall, this means, and you have already perfectly expected that, the Q&A session is likely to be more informative than the presentation session, and financial analysts can significantly drive the informativeness of these calls. With that rather longer background information on what we know from the literature, I'd like to come to our next poll question. And the next poll question here, we would like to um, be a little bit more, uh, think about that topic a little bit broader, which means we would like to know from you which individual characteristics of Q&A pairs in a conference call you would focus on. So we have talked about the tone, but of course, there are other linguistic attributes that might be informative, such as speed of speech, such as pauses or uncertain answers to questions, such as the complexity of language. And I'd like to ask you to quickly answer that question and uh, select one of these individual characteristics that you find the most informative one. Okay, that's a super cool picture. Um, so some of you also think that tone is informative, as we have discussed before. So 13% uh, find that informative. But most of you find that the pauses and uncertain answers to question is the most informative individual characteristic. That is um, super interesting, but also the complexity seems to be uh, informative to you. Um, so I think uh, there is no right or wrong to that question. Um, there is research conducted on all elements that we have listed here, and uh, you are perfectly right that C and D is already uh, um, an important element that was studied by prior research. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to directly uh, talk about uh, what the literature knows by now about these characteristics in the following. But in the following, I'd like to broaden the picture even further, and I will, will not only talk about the language um, of individuals, but also talk about the manager uh, as a whole. So what I'd like to do with you is uh, have a look at the individual characteristics of a manager and uh, talk about the information value that we can collect when looking at these uh, characteristics. Of course, it would be super uh, cool if we would stand in front of you right now, because then you could observe individual characteristics when looking at the four of us. And I'm perfectly uh, sure that you will have collect some information value when just observing us here. But unfortunately, due to this virtual format today, it's not possible to do that exercise. But what I'd like to do with you today is have a look at, at this picture here. So let's assume that this is a manager standing in front of us and we would like uh, to observe and describe this individual now. So what can we learn from looking at that manager? First of all, this manager is likely to talk with us, speak with us, and therefore the first characteristic that we could uh, talk about and uh, discuss what we can learn from that is the language. The literature discussed and examined the topic language, so the characteristic language a lot. And I'd like to just mention a few studies and a few characteristics that prior research has already looked at. There's research that has looked at uh, extreme language, and hereby we mean extremely positive and extremely negative words. So what the literature does here is uh, making use of psychological and linguistic uh, software that classifies words into extremely positive and extremely negative, and then simply counting how often that um, appears. Moreover, there's a study by Wang et al, who also has a look at the tone, and tone means positive and negative words. But here it's not just about uh, counting how often we have positive and negative words, it's more um, getting some measure of manager specific tone, so the abnormal tone that cannot be explained by firm fundamentals such as complexity, such as risk, such as performance. 
So that's the abnormal tone that is really uh, specific to that manager. Then we have a super cool study by Bushi et al. 2018 that has looked at the complexity of language. And complexity is measured here by the number, average number of words per sentence. Of course, if we have more numbers, uh, more words per sentence, this tells us that this is a more complex sentence. And it adds then the percent of complex words. And the sum of these two, the aggregate of this tool is called then the Fock index. And this is a measure used uh, to capture complexity. And finally, there's an interesting study by Lee 2016 that has looked at the spontaneity of language. Of course, this is pretty hard to capture. And this guy has a very cool idea because he makes use of um, a similarity measure that uh, measures the similarity between uh, the presentation session and the Q&A session. So if the language pattern is highly different in the Q&A compared to the presentation, this means that the Q&A is more spontaneous than a presentation session and the other way around. So these are just a few examples um, what the literature has already examined so far and what um, we can learn uh, when looking at language characteristics. Of course, when we look at that manager, there's another aspect, um, not only language, but also voice that we can observe. And here I just would like to highlight uh, uh, two studies that uh, we have found uh, by looking at prior research. That is a study by Mei Yu and Van Katahalam in 2012 and also Hobson and co-authors. And what they do is they um, analyze um, the voice of managers uh, by making use of a voice software. And this voice software provides two measures. That is a measure of the emotion level of the manager. So that is the excitement uh, exhibited by the manager. And it also provides some information on a cognitive level. And this tells us um, to what extent there is a conflict between actions and beliefs. So if the manager acts against his own beliefs, it is very likely that this person feels uncomfortable, has feelings of anxiousness, and therefore this becomes visible in the voice as well. So what they find is that there are some vocal markers of cognitive dissonance that might be informative. To be a little bit even a little bit broader here, of course, we can also have a look at the whole body of this manager. And here I'd like to quickly highlight one study by Davila and Guash. It's a working paper from 2020, and they construct a measure of body expansiveness. So what they do is they analyze 250 entrepreneurial teams that pitch their startup idea in front of investors and hereby um, draw some information on two 2D skeletal information about the uh, speaker's physical joints, which means they measure to what extent this manager moves head, feet and hands uh, by just looking at uh, the videotapes of these entrepreneurial pitches. What can we learn as well? We can have a look at the dress of that guy. And here I'd like to uh, uh, just illustrate one study by Gifford et al. in 1985 that is uh, from the psychological literature. And here we have, uh, they have looked at uh, employment interviews uh, for an actual research assistant position and want to understand the role of nonverbal behaviors, such as smiles, gestures, time to talk, and the dress of this applicant, and want to learn whether the evaluator, the, the, the employer, the future employer, likes these information and draws some information from uh, these uh, attributes in order to decide on uh, this job. And finally, I'd like to um, talk about one further study. Um, of course, we can also have a look at the face. And here we have one study by Gia et al that has looked at the face shape. So the idea would be that the, um, the ratio between um, the uh, the white, that the white to height ratio, that is the distance between the two sidions relative to the distance between the upper lip and the highest point of the eyelid, so that's really the white to height distance, that this is informative. But of course, after that whole description here, you will ask me, yeah, what can we learn from these kind of attributes? And this is exactly what I would like to show you on, on that next slide. 
So looking at these individual characteristics, what, what does that tell us? What can we learn from observing that? First of all, I'd like to, to talk about that language part. So what can we learn from uh, observing or uh, listening to, to these guys? And here just a few um, results that I'd like to present. First of all, these abnormal tone language, abnormal tone measure. This can tell us something about the extent to which managers want to mislead investors. So what uh, this study has found is that um, this abnormal tone is positively associated with upward perception management events such as meeting or beating earnings thresholds. The study by Bushi et al. provides us uh, with some signal on, on obfuscation of uh, investors. So they are able to uh, distinguish between the informational part of complexity and the obfuscational part of complexity. And they find that some element of that complexity in language is positively associated with information asymmetry. What about the voice? Uh, from the voice, uh, I'd like to, for the voice part, I'd like to mention two studies here. The first one is the by, a study by Hobson et al. 2012. Um, so they find that these vocal dissonance markers are positively associated with the likelihood of irregularity restatements. Moreover, I'd like to highlight one further FAR project by Pichai and co uh, colleagues that is also super interesting, looking at um, this, uh, the application of that voice software in the auditing context. So they have uh, preliminary evidence from uh, field studies, uh, field experiments with auditors, and want to examine whether that software may help auditors to improve the detection of fraud and also the level of skepticism. The body expansiveness measure. Um, here, the study by Davila and Guash has found that this is uh, informative about entrepreneurial skills. So, they find that if we have a higher body expansiveness, um, the managers or the entrepreneurs are um, more likely to provide less accurate forecasts and also have lower rates of survival. So, it seems to be that these expansive, uh, body expansive managers um, are less successful. On the other hand, we also uh, they also find that the firm valuation is higher. Moreover, they are more likely to get to getting funding success. So there is some con uh, contradictory uh, evidence provided in that study. On the one hand, it seems to be beneficial to have this high body expansiveness. On the other hand, there are also disadvantages related to that. Very quickly, just a dress idea that could be an inform information signal on social skills. Um, so this study has found that the formality of the dress is used to assess uh, social skills. And finally, the face shape study by Gia et al. They provide evidence that this ratio that I just told you about is uh, predictive of the firm's likelihood of being subject to an SEC enforcement action. With that little overview on prior research, I'd like to hand over now to my colleague Sebastian, uh, who will now focus exclusively on the language part. And here um, would like to talk a little bit more about our project and we'll start also with a short poll. So, so far we've talked about uh, two large building blocks of our project. We've heard a lot about internal controls, internal control issues, internal control auditing and also about earnings calls and financial ana analysts and their questions. And now it's time to put the two together. And so here I'm interested in your opinion. So we would like to know, what do you think? Which question here is most indicative of a weakness of an issue in internal controls? So these are four questions that were actually asked by financial analysts during actual earnings calls. And uh, there's no right or wrong way to, to, uh, to do this here. I would li like you to just take a minute, read through these four questions and just through some way, um, yeah, guess which one of these is uh, most likely to indicate that the firm having this earnings call has an internal control issue. Okay, so that's an interesting picture. I think most of you decided that question C is the longest question and it talks about uh, some things that could be interpreted in a negative light, that that's the most indicative of an internal control issue. The first question also a little bit and the second and the fourth, uh, not so much. So first of all, I would like to solve this by showing you what actually happened or which of these companies actually had an internal control issue. 
and I guess this was kind of a kind of a uh, kind of a trap here. So it's uh, the second and the fourth question. So the one the ones with uh, with the lowest number in the poll right here that uh, actually did have an ICMW. So the firms with the earnings calls where these questions were asked actually ended up having internal control issues. And the one for the first and the third question, they did not. So obviously uh, you might ask yourself, um, so how were we supposed to know that? And obviously uh, there's no real way to know that uh, from what you were given here. But we would actually also like to show you what our algorithm did with these questions. The algorithm uh, itself we'll be talking about in a second. So here's how well our model predicted it. So for the first question, our model um, got that fairly right. It decided or it rated the question in the bottom 1%, so uh, very unlikely that there was an ICMW in the year where that question was asked. For the second and the fourth, where there was an actual ICMW, our model also rated that uh, fairly decently and decided that it was in the top 1% for the likelihood of an ICMW. And because we don't uh, want to give the impression that our model is in any way perfect or close to perfect, for the third question, there wasn't any um, issue in internal controls for the firm, and our model rated that in the top 1% likelihood as well. So um, yeah, there was a decent performance, I would say, from our model, but it's not uh, without its flaws. Obviously, that's just um, a quick example, just uh, anecdotal evidence here from four questions. So um, I would like to take a step back and talk about the actual model and uh, the statistics and the, the methods behind it. So first of all, these are preliminary insights. This is uh, from the US setting and everything I will show you today is from a working paper um, by my colleagues uh, Christian Hofmann and Nina Schweiger and myself. And we are trying to uh, address the research question whether financial analyst questions during conference calls are informative about firms' internal control quality. And I would like to just uh, show this little graph, this little uh, timeline here uh, to, to, to make a little bit clearer uh, what we are looking at here. So in the, at the first point in time, t equals zero, we have the Onyx call. Here we can observe analysts and the questions that they ask. And then at a later point in time, just not necessarily uh, by some degree, just later in time, we have uh, the 10K or the filings where the ISMW is disclosed. And we would like to know whether there's any predictive value here. So if the analyst questions asked at this point can help predict the later disclosure of a 10K in the 10K of an ICMW. So um, as this already says, we measure this key concept of internal control quality via future or futurely disclosed internal control material weaknesses, which is, uh, I guess, a pretty, pretty standard approach. And we measure the questions or the information content of the question. Well, we try to measure what analysts say and how they say it. We've just talked about how everything in there can be informative and interesting, and we will get to how exactly we do that uh, in just a second. Some more uh, of the basic stuff. Uh, the firms that we look at here are S&P 500 companies. The, um, the time frame is between 2010 and 2018. We use all the calls in firm years where an ICMW was later at a later point in time disclosed and then uh, also match a control group by size and industry. And this leaves us with a sample of about 3,600 uh, firm years or firm quarters and over 100,000 question answer pairs. So with that in mind, let's talk uh, methodology. So the very first and uh, probably most interesting, most important part of a methodology is a topic model. And for those of you who don't uh, know what a topic model is, it's basically an unsupervised machine learning algorithm. And it finds in a corpus of documents, so in this case, uh, the, uh, the questions during earnings calls, it finds clusters of words that often appear close to each other. So in this case, we can interpret these clusters, which are then called topics, roughly as common types of questions or words that, um, that mark certain types of questions. And as we will later see, uh, these include both business terms such as merger and cash flow, and they also include uh, parts of question phrasing like um, wonder and expect, and that's the uh, what analysts are talking about and how analysts are talking uh, about it 
um, aspect uh, alluded to earlier. So, um, what is, I can actually see the chat. Uh, what is unsupervised? Yeah, uh, perfect timing because I was about to um, talk about that. It's a, um, actually, I think, um, a really a really nice advantage of this uh, approach is that we don't actually tell the algorithm what we expect to see or what, or what we want to see in the questions. We just let it find the most, um, the most relevant clusters. So basically the clusters of words that appear in a way that most of the variants in word choice and questions is explained. Uh, we use a total of, uh, of 50 topics and this way, this unsupervised way of conducting research here really just minimize, minimizes uh, the chance that we bias the results by yeah, putting in what we expected uh, ex ante. Okay, so we have this topic model and that allows us to assign questions to topics and we can add that up. So we have a topic distribution during an earnings call uh, for each earnings call. And then in the second step, um, internal control quality comes in. So what we do is we just uh, use a simple dummy variable, ICMW in the future, that's uh, zero or one, and we regress that variable on the topics. So on the distribution of topics for the earnings call. And we can then use the weights or the, the coefficients of this regression um, as weights on the topic distribution of each earnings call add up the weight, the weighted topic distribution of the earnings call, and that gives us a single number. We call this number the topic score, and basically it measures the information content of the analyst questions during that earnings call with regard to internal controls. So the higher that number is, the more questions in that earnings call were strongly in those topics that have high predictive power. Now this, uh, this second step um, already gives us um, very interesting information on the information content of analyst questions, but it only uses as an input uh, these, these um, topics and the topic distributions. And of course, we would also like to know if this approach has incremental predictive ability. That is, uh, how does it compare to the prediction that we would have if you just used fundamentals, for example, uh, fundamental determinants that were identified by prior literature. So for the third step, we use this topic score, we add a battery of controls, of control variables, and then, um, yeah, see if there's any incremental predictive ability here, or if you're just finding what we would have found otherwise as well. And before we go to the regression results, just to give you guys an idea what this topic model looks like, here are the 10 topics with the highest coefficient that is that are most strongly related to, to the existence of an ICMW within the firm. So in the coefficient, uh, that is just uh, the ranking. And the words, as you can see, they include both business terms and question phrasing, as I alluded to earlier. And uh, I think it, it gets um, kind of clear that there are two elements that happen to, uh, to be in common for most of these topics. So very, very many of these include elements that you would use if you try to phrase a question politely. For example, um, try and understand in one topic or wonder and expect. And many of the questions that are rated highly for these topics then sound something like, I'm just trying to understand or I, um, I wonder what I could expect. And that's basically a very indirect, very polite question. And I think that uh, that also goes nicely uh, with um, I think it was a question in the chat earlier about the trade-off between asking questions uh, negatively, how that might uh, affect the manager and their disposition to uh, to share any new information, that there's a good reason that we can see these polite question elements here and the highly predicting um, topics, because analysts uh, are likely trying to, to basically take the edge of their questions. And the second element that we find here are just forward-looking business terms. So questions about uh, trends and about the business model and about, yeah, for example, the second half of the year. So that's just um, some indication what these highly predicting questions uh, will look like in practice. Okay, just uh, a quick look back because this is actually really interesting on the, the questions from the poll from earlier. Again, uh, number two and four actually had an ICMW. And we can actually see that both these elements, that we, both these uh, elements that we observe and the highly predicting topics 
are actually um, part of these questions as well. For example, the second question that just starts with, I just want to make sure I understand, so a very defensive question. And then it asks about the outlook for the second half and about future quarters. And uh, the fourth question as well asks about expectations by management and about next year. So, and uh, the other questions, uh, they don't really don't really have that. So there's just some, um, some I think, some nice little coloring, some indication of uh, what we're looking at here. But again, um, th that's just uh, four questions and not necessarily uh, indicative of anything. So let's uh, skip to the regression results. So as you can see here in the left column, we have a couple of control variables, return on assets, uh, M&A activity, basically a fundamental determinants of internal control quality derived from prior literature. And here in the right column, we added our topic score, a singular measure of information content and analyst questions. And first of all, for this basic model, we find that the topic score is highly significant and that can be viewed as evidence that these questions do contain information about internal control quality. And that's just, I think, a nice way uh, to begin this uh, results part. We also, just to put this uh, into perspective a little bit better, we also use the predicted values from these two regressions to train classifiers and checked how well these two models did in actually predicting ICMWs on a binary one or zero level. And we find that the approach on the right, so the approach that adds the topic score, finds almost 11% more ICMWs than just the uh, battery of controls. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, or I certainly asked myself, well, we trained the data, or we trained the algorithm on data, and then we used this regression on the same data. So it is absolutely possible that uh, the high significance that we are finding here, or it could be that this is just um, overfitting, basically, that we're just uh, fitting this perfectly on what we're observing, and that uh, the relevance that we find is just a statistical artifact. So to make sure that this, this is not the case, we also uh, used this regression in a out of sample uh, prediction manner. So basically we trained the algorithm on the years 2010 until 2016 and evaluated that score that we got from this training set on the final two years of the data set. And as you can see, the topic score is still significant at the 5% uh, level, despite the fact that uh, the sample size has kind of decreased here. And this is just a nice way to make sure that this is uh, an actual effect that we're seeing here, or maybe not make sure, but some evidence that we're actually uh, seeing something here and that it's not just uh, statistical. And of course, uh, this particular part is also interesting uh, for the idea that this could be used to actually predict future, future ICMWs, or in other words, to assess internal control quality using data that we had in the past. Because obviously, when I'm trying to actually use that to assess internal control quality of a firm, I only have data on past um, earnings calls and uh, not on the ones from the future. Okay, we also did a couple of ad additional analyses that are just trying to find a little bit more three dimensionality here uh, to, to, to color in some of the things uh, that we that we are observing. Um, this is just supposed to be a short overview. We did a lot of, I think, very interesting stuff, found a couple of interesting things. So first of all, we wanted to answer the question whether the manager answers also have information content. So you could ask yourself if it's not just a question, but also the manager answer, especially given that we know that the manager has more information. So um, pretty easy approach to do that. We calculated an answer topic score using the exact same methods that we used for the question topic score. And then we added that to the basic uh, regression model. And the result showed that actually both of these scores um, are highly significant, which is interesting uh, in it by itself. Still, we decide to focus on the question score and generally just uh, more on what the analyst does and on the question, just based on the intuition that by the time we get to the Q&A section, the manager has already shared everything that they wanted to share in the uh, management presentation and any additional information that gets uh, that gets disseminated here 
is only prompted by the question. So the analyst is really responsible for the information added here. Second, uh, we look at the tone and complexity measures. Uh, we saw this earlier in Nina's part that tone and complexity can be very informative. And so we had a look at characteristics of these highly predictive questions and the answers to these questions. So what we find is highly predictive questions. So these are questions and topics that have high scores. They are um, characterized by a high, high amount of certainty and also negativity. And this is again and nicely in line with what we um, had earlier. The idea that there's a obviously a, a negativity in a question about an internal that is related to an internal control weakness because that's just by itself a negative thing. And it's likely that the analyst would want to be a very, very, fairly sure and certain of what they're saying to ask such a, such a question. And we also find that the answers to these questions are distinctly different. And um, that is some evidence that managers actually recognize these questions. They realize that these questions um, signal some information on uh, the analyst's part. So we find that the answers to these questions are uh, significantly longer. They are more complex uh, than the questions. That's using the, the FOG index from the Bushy paper that we talked about earlier. And interpreting this uh, the way that uh, Bushy did basically means that the managers try to obfuscate here. They don't actually give out any information or they try not to give out any information. And they also deviate from the topic of the question. So just using the same topics from a topic model, the, the more predictive a question is, the more likely the managers are to go into a different topic in their answer. So in general, this, this all points into the direction that managers realize when a question is highly predictive about internal control quality, and they try not to give out any more information. Finally, based on the idea, what, uh, again, what we said earlier, that analyst expertise and industry expertise um, drive the information content in these questions, we had a look at characteristics of financial analysts. And I think this is all um, what you or what we would have expected. We find that analysts ask um, significantly more predictive questions. So their questions are significantly um, more predictive um, when they have more experience in general, just as financial analysts, when they have more experience in the industry of the firm they're currently following, and also when they have experience with ICMWs. So if they've either followed a firm in the past that had an ICMW, or if they're currently following a different firm that also has an ICMW. So all of this shows that analyst expertise and yeah, their, their knowledge in the industry of the firm that they're following, is these are really, really the drivers behind that information content and the questions. So that was just a short summary, short overview of uh, some of the analyses we've done on this data set. And I think there's a couple of questions. Oh yeah, there's a couple of questions. Oh, we're allowed to ask questions or? So I'm, I'm just reading through the chat right now. So first of all, the, the 17, 18 firms, yes, they're the same as the 10 to 16 firms. I guess uh, that is important and I guess they are. Um, yeah, exactly with the uh, evaluation and the uh, the, the the danger of overfitting that's obviously a concern here. Um, the we did the same thing for the um, for the part uh, where we uh, where we used a prediction. We also used uh, I think a 80-20 uh, train test split, and that also worked very well. So we have a couple of ways to to make sure that this is uh, this is not the case. Do you also identify types of control pumps? We haven't done that yet. I think we have the data. We might do that. But uh, so far, that's not been not been a focus. If you can do that, that would be really cool because you know I, I know many papers you know that uh, use artificial intelligence algorithms to uh, you know, identify issues. Uh, you know, you know, becoming, for instance, better predictors of fundamental values than than people are. Uh, but the thing is, we they don't pinpoint us uh, as to what we really learn from it. And if you can really pinpoint, you know, and identify types of control problems, that is extremely cool. Yeah, I, I think I agree. So, yeah, um, with that, I hope um, 
Um, that was most of what was asked. So I would like to just um, thank you for your attention and hand back to Christian for the yeah, final part of what we do today. Yeah, thank you, um, Sebastian, for that. Um, so now we'll uh, full back uh, circle, right? Uh, um, to the, uh, the two work packages that we want to work on um, using the FAR data um, to improve our understanding about internal control quality um, and the, the link between internal control quality and the, the quality of the audit process. Um, I think that um, Jeroen's part really um, made it very transparent that um, we do already know quite a bit about that association, but very often um, our insights are based on very crude and coarse uh, measures. Um, and to the extent that there's more detailed data available, um, um, this would significantly enhance our understanding of that link. Um, and then secondly, the, the informativeness of earnings conference calls for auditors. Uh, so again, we know from prior work that these conference calls are informative for market participants, for investors, uh, for financial analysts. Um, and we try to provide here now some um, preliminary evidence um, that uh, these conference calls might also be informative for auditors. Um, now, frankly, there are many questions that you've also asked uh, in the chat uh, to which we really do not have uh, an answer uh, at that point, right? Uh, it's, we're really getting started um, on, on that topic. Um, but I think the, um, the results that we already get are quite promising that uh, these uh, algorithms, the algorithm that we've come up with here, um, that that could really provide some information that um, could be useful for auditors. Uh, now, granted, um, we've uh, uh, trained that algorithm using data from um, the large US from large US companies, um, which do have um, earnings conference calls, um, and that is not the case for many small private companies. Uh, um, but I think it's, uh, in, in principle at least, the algorithm and the topics that we've identified there um, um, might also be applied for uh, cases, for example, when um, uh, managers talk to financiers, to uh, bank managers, um, if, if there's a possibility to um, listen to that conversation and apply the logic uh, from the um, um, and, and, and the, the the topic uh, uh, scores that we've I did not the topic scores but the topics that we've identified um, that that could also give a hint on whether or not uh, um, in that case the um, bank managers the financiers expect that there is some internal control um, material weakness or some issue with the internal controls. Now granted, um, the financial analysts, they are, um, um, according to our understanding, um, industry experts and macroeconomic experts, um, um, and therefore they, might, uh, they differ from bank managers, but uh, sure enough, bank managers also do have quite some expertise um, that they can bring to the table. And uh, based on that expertise, they might also form some expectations about issues with internal controls and that uh, these expectations then affect the, um, uh, the questions that are being asked. Uh, for us to researchers to study that, of course, would require that we have structured data that would allow us to train the algorithm and uh, that is much more easy, obviously, done with the, um, the data that we do have from these earnings conference calls. Okay, I, I, I realize that we're already uh, beyond uh, past five o'clock, but certainly if, if there are any questions, uh, I or we are more than happy to uh, to take them and, and to, to answer them. All right, uh, with the audience, uh, let, let's take a few minutes for uh, for some for some questions. There's uh, 
uh, Andrew uh, asked the question, you know, uh, what can what can I learn from this as an as an auditor? Because uh, you know, so from the research, what can I learn from it as an auditor? How can I use your findings? Well, so one, I mean the. Uh, the data that we were using here, that was the conference call at some point in time, and that uh, how the information that is included in the conference call is associated with um, 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 a future uh, ICMW. So I think that uh, the, ex uh, the extent to which an auditor can make use of that information is um, run the prediction model that we've came up with. Um, using the most recent earnings conference call. And then um, the uh, result of that would be an indicator whether or not there is an internal control material weakness uh, at that particular company. And um, uh, as an auditor, I mean, surely you do have some own expectations with whether or not there is an issue with the internal controls. Um, but the algorithm here could uh, either substantiate uh, that uh, expectation or it might signal you that, well, um, maybe you're, you're wrong. So it, it, it's just an additional information source um, that uh, one can use to, um, to assess the quality of these internal controls. Um, we're not uh, expecting and we're not claiming that the algorithm here is perfect, right? I mean, that would really, that's not uh, plausible to to uh, to expect that, but at a minimum, the um, algorithm should provide some additional information, some additional insight whether or not um, one needs to have a more careful look into the internal controls. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think I think. You know, given that we are past five, uh, I think we should uh, we should actually uh, uh, conclude uh, at this stage. I, I just want to I just want to thank uh, to thank you a, a lot for uh, for this excellent presentation, and I do think that uh, that you know that all of us can, can use this uh, the findings that you have uh, to 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 a large extent. Uh, as, as you've argued, right, uh, and you know, going further in the in the in the research that that, that will appear uh, to be the case, and uh, I'm sure that at uh, at one stage you will be presenting at uh, at our conference, and then convince the audience uh, of uh, of that. So uh, so so that is really uh, that is really great. Um, we had actually quite we had an audience uh, that uh, if you look at it, maybe I can share this now. Uh, so. Let's see where that works. Uh, so, so we had like like uh, more than uh, more than half of the uh, people who are here in in the in the meeting are actually uh, no, I, I it doesn't work with sharing anyhow. Uh, so more than half of it were actually practitioners. So it would actually be great if if if, uh, if these practitioners could could if they have time for that to get back to you and uh, you know. Ask them your questions uh, because that is, would be very conducive for your research as well. So, so I would like to invite everyone you know that has been listening today, uh, but maybe has, hasn't been able to ask their questions to reach out uh, to uh, to this research team. And if you can't find their addresses, uh, please contact me because I can find them, and, uh, so that they, so that they can uh, so that they can be helped with uh, with your uh, with your input. Uh, and and they they will be helped with it. So uh, so I would like to thank uh, you know you presenters uh, uh, Christian, Sebastian, uh, Jeroen, and uh, Nina, and uh, thanks for that. And um, uh, I also would like to thank all the participants uh, that uh, were present today and asked their questions uh, for being an active audience and uh, and uh, and and also for their interest. So thank you for that. And uh, we keep organizing these masterclasses, so uh, uh, please uh, come back uh, at uh, at uh, at our uh, at our meetings uh, that we have. And of course, at uh, uh, the next month in uh, June 20, 21st, we have our conference. So uh, I hope you can be there as well. And I'm looking forward to that.